Anderson. Welcome to The Realignment. Thank you. It's great to be here. Good to see you, Derek. Good to see you. We were talking about this before the show, but typically we'll have a narrative. But when we were researching for this, Derek, you wrote a piece on Wall Street bets, and then I woke up this morning and there was a great thing on Zoom. You go a bit back earlier, there's a conversation about how millennials moving will transform American politics. This show is called The Realignment. So we're giving up with a tidy narrative, and we're just going to have a wide-ranging conversation basically about everything you've written since, I'd say, mid-2019. Most of that <laughs> okay. is going to hold up uh, despite the coronavirus stuff. So let's start here. Um, we did a emergency episode about the Wall Street bets fiasco. And basically over the weekend, all of that's completely invalidated. You had a piece on Friday that was talking about Anthony Scaramucci's point that this could be the next French Revolution. Anyone who followed this news this weekend shows that that narrative is a bit mixed. So just you just give us a narrative state of play. Where are we at with Wall Street bets? Uh, wow, you guys are starting off with uh, the hardest possible question. Explain Wall Street bets uh, yeah, in, in 15 seconds. Here's, here's, I think, a good way to think about uh the last week. Uh, think about it from the lens of everything you thought was true about this story is wrong. Like the original take on the story was that this was like a really, really clean David versus Goliath narrative, mm -hmm. except in this version of the David versus Goliath narrative, because, you know, people thought that Robin Hood paused trading on GameStop in order to help the hedge funds, you know, the Goliath in this case, it's a little bit like, I suppose, in the original David Goliath story, if like the slingshot that David was using malfunctioned based on a magical spell that the Goliath <laughs> cast on the slingshot. Um, but it turned out, I, I, could, I could continue to unspool yeah. that metaphor, but there's no point in doing so because it's just clearly not true. Um, the tidy David versus Goliath narrative was just wrong. First, Reddit's, you know, Wall Street Bet subreddit just isn't really a David. It really seems like some of the oldest and longest tenured subscribers of this subreddit like work in wealth management, like they work mm -hmm. in the finance industry. This is just like their virtual bar where they come together and get a little drunk and talk about their favorite trades. Like they're not really the ordinary common man, they're probably more like people that are making a six-figure salary and just love betting. So David isn't quite David. Um, no question that Goliath is Goliath. Like the hedge fund is a hedge fund and, and that's clear. But the Robin Hood story in particular was just totally misunderstood. I mean, what clearly seems to have let's happened- Let's explain that, Derek, because yeah. I think the key point was, and this is where I actually blame Robin Hood a lot just for like not explaining this clearly. I mean, look, I'm not gonna say the guy lied, but Andrew Ross Sorkin asked the CEO on live television, he's like, do you have a capital problem, liquidity problem? And he said, I think he said no. Um, and then in the last 24 to 48 hours, he's raised, what, $2.4 billion? Three, almost $3 billion. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's right. raised yeah. almost $3 billion. So I'm like, okay, sounds like he had a liquidity problem. Then he puts out a statement later, I think it was yesterday or the day before, when he's like, yeah, we had to halt trading because our clearinghouse, which executes our trades, was like, hey, you need more money in the bank in order to comply. Was it some Dodd-Frank regulation? Anyway, mm -hmm. as you said, the, the, clear the clear answer on the story, if they had just said why they were pausing trading and not like lied or not lied out and not had been a lot more forthcoming about it then i think a lot of the conspiracy theorizing would be a lot less than where we are right now right you're totally right uh, you are you're yeah. saying that, i think very very well i mean you had the night that robin hood paused trading on gamestop and a couple of the other memes uh gamestop and a couple of the other meme stocks always very difficult to have the word gamestop and stock in the same sentence yes yes <laughs> But that same night, it was Dave Portnoy, the CEO of Barstool, going on Tucker Carlson and saying that these guys should be put in prison because this is the greatest mm -hmm. scandal in the history of American finance or something. Sorry, back up two steps. The actual story is that a startup brokerage didn't have enough money to deal with an unprecedented day of volatility on a meme stock popularized by people who were classic game, uh, classic Robin Hood users. Yes, so right. in a way, to s return to my extremely tortured David versus Goliath metaphor, <laughs> the slingshot did break. The slingshot broke, but it broke because it was like a startup slingshot. Yes. It broke because it wasn't like they, they were. They didn't want to use old brokerages. They were using some you know new non uh, zero commission trade brokerage. 
And that's why it broke. So look, I, I just don't have a great deal of sympathy for the notion that what we saw was just an extraordinary display of good old fashioned American populism. Mm -hmm. Good old fashioned American populism. No, sorry, scrap that. Good new fashioned American populism, just good populism should be public policies that try to get money into the hands of middle class and lower middle class people so that they can save money, which is put in an index fund that they never fucking think about. That's populism. Instead, what we're talking about is asking upper middle class and maybe middle class people who do have some money to spend to become day traders. Like that is the meme that was yes. getting out there from AOC and a bunch of other people who should just know better. Like if these people wanna play around with Robin Hood, they wanna play around with day trading, like whatever, I'm not that much of a paternalist, but it should not be the point of order for like, leading American left populists like AOC to valorize day trading. She should be telling people, she should be A, working on policies that make the middle class richer, and B, trying to get middle class people to save money by putting in index funds that are broadly diversified that they never have to think about. The best way to play the market is not to play at all. And that basic message about investing and wealth creation and wealth building got totally lost as everyone was just trying to shimmy this mm -hmm. like grizzly bear of a story into the little perfectly thin corset of a David versus Goliath narrative. And it just didn't work. I'm so glad that you said that, Derek, because I am watching people like meme themselves into becoming free market libertarians. And I'm like, <laughs> no, stop. The, like, speculation is not like a good thing. We should not be encouraging people to like wildly speculate. On and then the counter to that that I'm hearing is like, well, you know, they do it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I agree. Let's stop it. Like, it's bad. You know, there's a lot of things which are happening, you know, on the street, which are bad. And let's get back to what you talked about there with populism, with new age and good populism would look like. Because here's the fascinating part, which is that, as you said, people should know better because the impetus is real. As in, there are a, l a lot of people who are like, hey, you know what? Screw Wall Street. And if you look at you know, some of the people who I think are downstream of the money managers and others who are on Wall Street bets, look at the, the, the emotion that you actually can see in some of these posts. They're like, look, my dad lost his job in 2008. Like, I sat there and I, we all ate ramen. Some of my friends ate tomato soup that was made out of cafeteria ketchup packets. And then what they're doing is that they are channeling that energy into obviously buying GameStop stock. Now look, maybe it worked out at this time, but I think most people who are getting in on the trade are probably gonna get hosed. But the the key point there is that there is an underlying like impetus and desire to say, screw you to a lot of people on Wall Street. And I actually think that's a good thing. I think that's important. Now get to that in particular though, which is that how you channel that in a, how do you channel that correct message that you just pointed out in an environment where you have a lot of people who are willing to just meme themselves or use the meme of GameStop itself in order to push like their own radical agenda one way or the other. Yeah, I think that the people who are trying to essentially hitch a ride on the glider of this story are just totally misunderstanding what populism should be about in the first place. Yes. Populism should be about seeking solutions that help the most people. It shouldn't be about letting your ideology get dragged around by the horse of, if my enemies feel pain, that's good enough, right? Yes. Yeah, like yeah. one hedge fund getting screwed is not <laughs> like the triumph of populism. Mm -hmm. Especially <laughs> when other hedge funds are on the other side of the bed. 19 other hedge funds that are up hedge 800%. Fund getting rich. Yeah. I mean, you know, who the, you know who the biggest shareholders of GameStop were on January yeah, like 15th? Or something. Yeah. Fidelity yeah. and BlackRock yeah. 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 and a bunch of other hedge funds. Like, yeah. It's just crazy. Hey, they're youngest bunch, by like 20, I'm kidding. Yeah. A bunch of billionaires <laughs> the, the became yeah. more billionaire-ish as a result yeah. of this trade. And yes, some middle class people also made a couple thousand dollars and that's cool. But like the triumph of populism is not, let's find one bad guy and force him to experience such excruciating pain that we can like distribute the pain psychologically over the mass of the American population and like yes. that's their victory. No, like what, what policy would work here? It should be to like, we should be talking about like getting people money, you know, expanding child allowances, just you know, boring meat and potato stuff, mm -hmm. expanding their earned income tax credit if we like that. I love the Biden buck stimulus plan. Let's talk about 
telling people that if they are really interested in wealth formation, especially in their 20s and 30s, that the formula for wealth formation is really simple. You spend less than you earn if you are in a tax bracket or in, at an income level that allows you to do so. And then what you don't spend, you basically put into a Fidelity diversified index and don't think about it for 40 years. Like, that's what we should be talking about. We shouldn't be having AOC getting on Twitch, talking to the stock guy, whoever the fuck, and like valorizing day trading and speculation as if like they are the Williams, Jennings, Bryans of the future. Like they're, they're not. Mm -hmm. Like this is just a stupid way to talk about getting rich in the long term. So yeah. something I want to understand better is A, the meaning of the term establishment, especially in this context, because something that was very frustrating for me from a media perspective is you had a bunch of people... Dave Portnoy, Anthony Pompliano, who's a big um, crypto decentralization guy, the Winklevi twins making their like constant like their their ability to just appear in cultural moments is just incredible. Like that's their actual superpower. But in many ways, these are people who are not the traditional establishment, but in many ways are their own sort of like decentralized establishment. Shamath himself, Paliapatia, has his own like very political agenda, uh, and is a very good person at using populist ideas and rhetoric. So how do we just short sort through who's using what to do? Well, I guess I'm just trying to look for a good mental framework because what was so frustrating is you would just see all these people say, sorry, a better way to put this, there was this instance where the Winklevi twins were, were, were asked, hey, do you guys have any money in this? They said, oh no, we don't. But we're just encouraging people to do it. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, well, you're encouraging people to do this because you're advancing, you want these people all to buy Bitcoin. So there's all this right, like dynamic right, yeah. where everything's all tied together. So how do we just... How do we think about that? Because that's what I think people are lacking the most. Um, that's a great, great question. I so so maybe ironically, like I'm talking about what I consider to be good populism. I think that um, uh, that I don't actually consider myself, um, according to most people's definition, like a populist. Mm -hmm. I, I I'm more of like a utilitarian and like a consequentialist, which are just like stupid multisyllabic ways of saying I want to do good for the most people. And I don't care about the moral intentions of any policy unless it actually does good. So mm -hmm. that's, wh that's where I stand on public policy in general. So on Chamath, for, for instance, um, seems like a really bright guy. Uh, I, I don't know a lot about him. I would like to know more. But I saw a lot of people in my Twitter feed tweeting a really interesting juxtaposition of two different tweets. Um, one of them was his saying that he only cares about two things, climate change and income inequality. Um, and the other was him, I believe, uh, talking about how uh, it's really terrible to talk about raising taxes on capital gains. Well, look, one of the reasons why we have income inequality is that you've got lots of people that are building massive wealth based on their investments, which are preference by the tax code because of lower capital gains taxes. So, you know, it, it actually would make sense in the biggest picture to try to reduce income inequality by raising taxes on capital gains for the purpose of redistributing that income to the, low, to, to the poor. Um, right. That's not the only way to do it. And I'm not sure that you know, raising capital gains taxes is at the top of my list, but that, does, that is like an interesting tension, I think, between, two, between his two positions. And I would just like us to talk more clearly about like what are the ways to help people um, that we think are like good policy for the vast majority of people. Like what's a good utilitarian way to think through this problem? And it's just very clear to me at like a sort of just first level analysis that advocating for speculation, glorifying speculators just because uh, they happen to have identified um, like a big bad wolf in the forest in the form of this hedge fund, that's, that, that's not gonna cash out um, as a benefit for most people. That is a, that is a bad utilitarian policy. What's so great about this is you're getting to a frustration I had. As someone who, I'm not finance first, like this is not my space, but a lot of people, especially when the news was that Robinhood was intervening in a really negative way, were saying, see, this is why we need crypto. This is why we need the blockchain. This is why decentralization is the answer. No one was actually articulating, though, like why those things were inherently good. So rather than saying, it's really bad that we're not letting normal people operate in a casino economy, we therefore need to use decentralization to further that. They just said decentralization is good in of itself. So I just think that people should really take away the case for in these spaces where we don't have that much information using the utilitarian framework. Yeah. And when it comes to Bitcoin and crypto, I, I should say, I really, I am not an expert on this space. Um, I, I feel strongly about only two things when it comes to Bitcoin. First, I remember the debate from five years ago or so when people said, you know, Bitcoin could be the future of currency. 
well, it's a terrible currency. Um, no one sh ever does or ever should use Bitcoin to buy, you know, bananas and toilet paper um, because it's an extremely volatile asset. But it is an interesting asset. Um, and it is being used by a lot of people in lieu of something like gold or silver as a kind of hedge. And I'm curious to see the evolution of cryptocurrencies as a sort of um, uh, asset used within a well-diversified portfolio uh, to hedge against various macroeconomic outcomes or, or sort of trading volatility. Um, so that's, that's what I would say with, with crypto. Um, but I, I am not sure exactly about how mm -hmm. it's going to evolve as an actual currency the next few years. Oh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. Also, it takes forever. Uh, if you ever send any Bitcoin to somebody else, it takes like an hour in order to prove on the blockchain. <laughs> uh, I think this is another question um, that we have, Derek, which is that if we're looking forward, kind of the theme here is about there's a shifting moment right now in American politics. You actually just wrote a piece today, which caused like a little bit of a stir about remote work. And mm -hmm. I thought it was really interesting just about how remote work and is going to change the nature of cities, the geographic makeup of America. It's basically, I think that what was the term? It was the, what the highway was to the 1950s, 1960s of America. So let's, let's talk about that both. Let's, let's start with like a civilian level. Like what is that going to mean just for our day-to-day -day lives and the makeup of our cities in the future? Yeah. Uh, so let's start at like the 30,000 foot level. Um, Remote work. It's not something everyone can do, right? It's something the three of us can do, or I guess yes. technically four of us on the Zoom call yes, right now. Um, none of us are in the same room, I think, unless there's some trickery going on. Mm -hmm. um, and yet we're all having a conversation that's really easy. Uh, that's fantastic. And this is a, a fact of life for today's knowledge workers or white collar workers. It's not true for a retail salesperson. It's not true for a cashier. It's not true for a nurse or a surgeon. There are tens of millions of jobs that at the moment just cannot be uh, telecommutable. And that's just a fact. But there's lots that can. And what this article is saying is that even a moderate revolution in remote work could have huge implications for the geography of opportunity in America. And the reason for that, I suppose, could be most efficiently put like this. We have a problem in the 21st century economy, where the American dream has been bifurcated, it's been split. The cities that are the best at upward mobility, right, at taking someone who is born lower middle class, but they can become upper middle class, the cities that are best at that kind of economic mobility are prohibitively expensive. They're yeah. places like New York, San Francisco, Seattle. And the places that are cheap, are not particularly good at upward mobility. And so the American dream that wherever you are, you can plug yourself into an economy wherein if you work hard, you can you know, move ahead in class. We can criticize that dream and that's probably another podcast or two. I have lots <laughs> of issues with it. But in reality, the fact of that thing has split apart. And the reason it's split apart is because basically America's most productive cities are just too expensive. There's a shortage of housing. Now, historically, the fact of a city has always meant the tethering of home and work, right? You farmed in the city that you worked. You went to the mill or the factory in the 19th century in the city where you worked. What would it mean if work and home were untethered in some way? Would Americans all move to the suburbs as they did in the 1950s? Would they move to the exurbs and become super community, super commuters, as it's sometimes called? Or will they essentially keep their job in Boston, but move to Phoenix, keep their job in Washington, D.C., where I live, but move to, you know, Minneapolis? I think it's very possible that you could see a large share of the white collar workforce decide that if they can keep their job wherever they live, they'd much rather buy a bigger house just somewhere else. And enough of them are going to do that that it could have major implications for the shape of the American economy and the distribution of America's most talented, productive workers. Mm -hmm. What's What's great about the piece is, and it helps to write this piece six months into the pandemic rather than right during, is we saw lots of overstated cases. New York City is just totally over. That was back in August. Mm -hmm. The whole case of everyone's going to move to Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Mm -hmm. Your point is that, your piece isn't anti-city, 
it's anti-cities that have specific negative traits because too many of the decentralization, like the, my whole theme today is basically pushing back against decentralization, folks, is people's objection isn't to the city. It's to the objection of the cost being too high. It's the objection to having to, if you're living in New York, you have to like pay lots of money to go to a really expensive private school versus going to, for example, I'm from Portland, Oregon. You mm-hmm. could live in the outer suburbs and go to an excellent, excellent like public high school. So it's not anti-city in of itself. Something we're wondering, though, is to what degree is the sort of case for a city like New York in this? Because from my perspective, I want to move to New York. I want to go into the middle of everything. Charlotte's great. You know, Austin's great. But they don't have the center. Like, there is a case to be made to the city. Could you, so can you speak to, like, what the sort of more yeah. bull case for a city like New York, San Francisco, L.A., these places that have a lot of mistakes, but, like, 1970s New York, 1980s New York, that was way worse than it, well, maybe not, but hypothetically, that was a situation that could be just as bad, if not worse. Yeah, I think, you know, it's almost a cliche to say this pandemic will accelerate X. Yes. But in this case, the cliche is a cliche for a reason, as so many cliches are. Um, (laughs) So two years ago, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic, an essay called The Future of the Childless City. And like all headlines, this was an exaggeration and simplification of what I was really saying, which is that mm-hmm. in a lot of rich, expensive, highly productive cities like your New York's and San Francisco's, Seattle's, families with kids seem to be moving out and young college educated people who were single seem to be moving in. And so the culture of the city was evolving towards servicing the interests of the young and affluent. They were becoming playgrounds for young, colleged, 20-somethings and 30-somethings. I think what I'm predicting about New York is that that will accelerate because more families with established jobs at, at knowledge worker companies, I, should, I don't want to be too you know, economic and fancy here, knowledge worker companies, I mean like you know, Google, a PR firm, a marketing firm, design firm. You're established at the company, you have a good relationship with the boss, you have two kids under the age of six, and you live in a part of Brooklyn or Manhattan or the Bronx that is just, just using New York as, as an example here, this is just a little too crammed, right? It, it's just, and it's just really, it's a little crammed, and more importantly, it's really expensive. You know what you're and, saying? You're saying you're Andrew Yang, speaking of his- And so, and so you think like, you know, whenever I visit my friends in the suburbs, they have these, they have these lawns, as long as they have pools. Yeah, and nice. so you move. And so <laughs> yeah. I, I'm not suggesting anything too radical here, except that more parents in that position will make the decision to leave those cities and their decision will be, will enjoy the tailwind of the remote work, of the remote work revolution because people will recognize I can move to these cities, you know, an hour away, an hour and a half away uh, cities and suburbs and small towns outside of New York come into the office once a week, once every two weeks, and that will be fine. Mm-hmm. I can have a much bigger house, and, I, and everything will be fine professionally. I think that is the trend that is more likely to excel, to accelerate. And what I the way I describe it in the um, in the piece is to say that it's the it's the rise of the super commuter. So historically, super commuting is something that has really been more like an affliction on poor low-income workers in places right. like San Francisco and New York, where you couldn't afford to live in the East Village, so you lived out in Brooklyn, and you had to commute 50 minutes, 120 minutes a day into your job. Um, but what if the next stage in the growth of super commuters, people commuting more than like an hour a day, are these affluent families who move up in the Hudson Valley and move out into, the, into Central California, if we're talking about San Francisco, um, because they recognize they don't have to come and to the office as much. That's what I'm predicting. And one, one more point that I just want to make, because I think when I talk about remote work, a lot of people are like, a lot of people say this. They say, I wouldn't do that. Okay, mm-hmm. fine. That's great. There are yeah. tens of millions of people that I'm talking about in these categories. And if just a small number of them behave differently, it could have a huge effect. And the, the right metaphor here is to think about the retail sector. So in 2015, Retail, online retail accounted for less than 10% of all retail. Less than 10%, right? Amazon, Walmart.com, everything. But still, if you had any conversation with the future of retail, it was about e-commerce. So the, the, the 9% tail was wagging the dog of the other 91%. You could have a similar thing happen with remote work, where even if just 9% of the US workforce is fully remote in, say, 2024, someone could say, oh, look, 
you know, Derek was predicting a remote work revolution and 91% of Americans are still working in offices and, you know, stores and, um, uh, and, and hospitals. Well, that's fine. But the 9% could still have a huge effect on which cities are growing, which cities are shrinking, where are productive, talented people moving. Um, the 9% can still be huge. So you kind of hit at this when you made the point that the problem is basically that the big super zip cities are too expensive, but the red operationally um, sunbelt um, southern cities aren't as great about actually providing opportunity to the same degree. How much of this is a partisan phenomenon? Because basically the way this is described, just depending on which part of Twitter you hang out at, is the red state people say, see, Texas is cheap, Florida is cheap, all the libs are fleeing expensive New York and SF. And then they then at the same time will say things like, and what is going to happen negatively is they're going to move to a city like Austin and then import a lot of the like, for example, a lot of the Texas is a, is a state that's very sort of pro-development. So a lot of uh, Austin tech pros, I mean, sorry, SF tech pros are going to move to Austin and they're going to bring NIMBYism with them. How, <laughs> how much is that like a reality or is this really a, a phenomenon which isn't that partisan in terms of like decisions cities are making? from a Republican or Democratic perspective? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think it's hard to disentangle in a coherent way the motivations of millions of people at mm -hmm. once. So if you imagine all these people who want to move and are moving to the Atlanta Metro, the Austin Metro, the Phoenix Metro, the Las Vegas Metro, uh, Charlotte is booming, Columbus, Ohio is booming. It, it, most of these places are in the South and West, but they're somewhat sprinkled across the country. Um, hard to disentangle why all of these people are, are, are moving at once. Some of them might be doing so politically. They're like, they're fed up with California. Mm -hmm. A lot of, uh, and, they're, and they're conservative. But I think a lot of them are moving because they are in their late 20s to early 40s. Their family is just getting started. And family life with kids is just a fundamentally different thing than being single in a city, running around with your friends. And as a result, you have a lot of just family-based decisions, which by virtue of the fact that they are family-based, are about where can I be happy and feel comfortable with my wife or my husband? Where's a pretty good public uh, uh, school district for my kids? And where can I buy a house that's gonna make us all feel comfortable and happy? Uh, at a price level that makes sense for my current job. And I think that those sort of social, cultural, familial, economic factors are probably driving moves more than the political consideration. It's funny though, Derek, because thinking about that, that actually has huge political ramifications because I'm looking at, I was pulling up your article right here. According to the chief economist of Zillow, the online searches for Boise, Phoenix, and Atlanta are rising fastest amongst people who live in LA and New York. I'm like, oh, well, Phoenix and uh, Atlanta, that's interesting. Those are two states which just went blue for the first time in a long time. And if I'm a party with Marjorie Taylor Greene um, as, my, uh, as my mascot, I'm like, oh shit, I don't know if I'm ever gonna win the state of Arizona or Georgia again. So it's funny because if this isn't a political story. It's like you said, outside of like Joe Rogan, most people cannot afford to leave <laughs> California because they're like, oh, these lockdowns are crazy. Like that's like Elon Musk and Joe. That's not actually representative of a, of a, a lot of people. But a lot of people like me and you, and I totally empathize, especially on a day like today in Washington where that got hit with some ice this morning on my face. I was like, yeah, you know, Phoenix sounds pretty nice right now. Um, and it's like, yeah, more space. Dog can take a walk and not have to get hit with ice. Maybe have two dogs, three dogs. I'm kind of a dog guy. And so I'm like, oh, this, you know, this, this is actually pretty good. You start a family, your kids, you don't have to walk in the ice, blah, blah, blah. So that, though, it becomes metapolitical in the sense that we're changing the electorate. And we generally know, and this is something you wrote a lot about during the primary, I cited it actually a lot of my show Rising, was that what's the Democratic Party right now, Derek? A lot of it is linked to, especially the people that we're talking about here, are probably most likely to become the super mobile workforce of the next five years. So how do you think that that's going to play out? Whereas, you know, if, if enough people move to Phoenix and Atlanta, which has already happened, or even Austin, I mean, I believe the most common U-Haul route in the country pre-pandemic was San Francisco to Austin. This is going to dramatically change, you know, the electorate. And on the margins, that's red or it's blue. That's, you know, 50, 100 electoral votes that we're talking about. 
Look, I think you're entirely right. Uh, the, the piece that I think you might be referencing um, by me is a piece where I said that uh, for Democrats, uh, density yes. yeah. is destiny. Yes. Uh, de diplomas and density really together mm -hmm. are destiny um, to be maximally alliterative. Um, it is Democrats are dominating now among people with college degrees and they're dominating in large metros. Um, I actually, I had a draft of a piece um, that ended up being sort of disentangled and thrown into 17 different other pieces. Um, but I, I just pulled it up as you were talking and I'm just gonna read a, yeah. two paragraphs from it Do because it. Yeah. like it, what I wrote here is as articulate as I'll be on the point <laughs> that you're making. So you're, we're, um, I'm writing about how the pandemic is accelerating um, this migration toward the South and West. This is, this is now quoting from the article that never appeared. Quote, mm -hmm. between 2010 and 2018, the eight metros that added the most domestic movers were in order, Dallas, Phoenix, Houston, Austin, Tampa, Atlanta, Charlotte, and San Antonio. If you take a good hard look at that list, you'll see something that connects those cities beyond their infernal average temperatures in July. They are all located in states that voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And something else you should know about the people moving there, they're disproportionately in their 20s and 30s. Uh, Brookings analysis finds that the peak in interstate migration happens in people's late 20s through late 30s. Um, all therefore part of the historically left-leaning millennial generation. You put it all together and the migratory shift accelerated by the pandemic isn't just a geographical shuffle, it's a political earthquake with young liberals remaking the electoral landscape of the South and West. If these millennials retain their generation's left-leaning politics, they could repaint the red sunbelt a light shade of blue. Yep, so That's 100%. it. Here's the first question that comes from that. I love that. Um, how will these Democrat leading voters change if the world they operate in, in changes. So for example, if you're the Bernie version of the Democratic Party, student loan debt is a much bigger issue if you're in a super expensive like hovel in some corner of Brooklyn. Issues around transportation, Amazon factories like of AOC, like all of those circumstances. Like if you're just if you're your average Jacobin reader, so much of those circumstances are driven by just being in a coastal city. How do you think let's say the 30 something couple that moves to Austin from New York, how will they shift? Because from my perspective, we run into this talk because we have Bernie listeners who think the Democratic Party is, cons is conspiring against them. From my perspective, the Democratic Party you're describing seems to be very Mayor Pete friendly, very Joe Biden friendly. That is not the party that's gonna be pushing for Medicare for all, not because there's a MSNBC fuel conspiracy, but just because the actual bodies in that party is not gonna go direct in that way. So how do you think about that? Yeah, this, this is a great question. And um, I don't know for sure, again, because I don't entirely, have, I don't have a great understanding of everyone's motivations for moving. And so I don't know what states are collecting like the conservative out migrants from California Florida. and what states are collecting. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Florida, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I do know, right, I, I do know yeah. the answer to that. <laughs> um, but but you're, you're right, this, like you're asking in a way, and. Correct me if this is a, a bad paraphrase of your question. Um, is there a difference between the Democratic Party whose center of gravity is the swoosh between the southwestern states at the four corners, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, um, and Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Georgia. Nevada, oh. um, and, then, and then Georgia, um, and then including the metros of, of Texas. Um, is there a difference between that party and, uh, and sort of the, the, the left-leaning party that's emerged in online volume uh, concentrated in Brooklyn and San Francisco? Yes, I think 100%. there might be. Yeah, I, think, I, I do think there might be. I mean, look, look at the senators from the Southwest, right? So this is the first time the Democrats have controlled all eight senators from the four corner Southwest states. That's Nevada. Wow. Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico. First time since the 1930s, they've had all eight. But look at the uh, political orientation of their senators. Hickenlooper, just one in Colorado, he's not a leftist. He's a classic yeah. left center guy. Uh, Kristen Sinema, Arizona, probably the, maybe the most conservative member of the Democratic caucus. 
Um, other than more mansion, than mansion, really. Other than, other than mansion, right? Okay, yeah. yeah. I was gonna um, be shocked. Probably, if that was, probably yeah. her, probably her and mansion. Uh, Kelly, the new senator, uh, isn't isn't particularly left leaning, um, and you know, Warnock, you know, Asav is is clearly a was a was a early resistance darling, but Warnock doesn't strike me as as particularly uh, far left. He strikes me as as um, potentially closer. Maybe closer to Hickenlooper in politics than AOC. You might disagree that with that. Seems, um, that the one no, thing, I think you're right. I think well, you're here's right. what I'd say because conservative listeners are going to be screaming on cultural issues, especially ones like relate back to the black community. So his comments about, you know, he had some, uh, I don't want to like quote anything that I don't know for sure, but he basically, there were a couple cringy things he said about the state of the US yeah. um, pre when he was running for office. So on cultural, but this is the key thing. And this is why like these black, like black voters in the South voted for Joe Biden on cultural issues, definitely like to the left, but in terms of his economic program, this isn't a Medicare for all guy. But I think that's the key thing that you're saying. I'm trying to, I think it's exactly, it's, it's a great yeah. way of, of focusing what I was trying to what I was scrambling for because I'm trying to think of like how his how his ideology is likely to cash out in Senate votes and my yeah. guess is that when they do like you know the gov track lineup of like you know who's yeah. the who are like the most liberal and most conservative senators that he'll be closer to uh, you know Hickenlooper than Bernie because um, the culture no because question. especially and this is the key thing because especially in the black community the cultural stands are divorced from the economic ones mm. and one that I don't think is true in that SF, LA, New York, DC. That's Democrat a really insightful point. Band. That makes a lot of yeah. sense to me. So so to, to, I guess, bring what I'm trying to say to a conclusion, um, it seems that the Democratic Party of the Southwest and the Southeast is not the party of AOC. It's the party of something else. And they don't necessarily maybe have like a media friendly ringleader, but like those four corner states will eventually decide like, what is our caucus? What are we for? Like it, politics in general is becoming way more media facing. And your, one's future in politics is about your ability to like broadcast a clear, uh, coherent ideology and brand. Like what's that Southwest Democratic Senator brand going to be? It's, it's not going to be the far left brand. And so I guess the, in, the bottom line is my answer to your original mm -hmm. question 17,000 minutes ago was, is <laughs> yes. It's a, th th these are two different poles within the Democratic Party. And I think there's going to be a little bit of a tug of war sometimes between them. You know yeah, who it I is, totally the real quick Sagar. I yeah. know exactly who, it's Chamath Palahapitiya. <laughs> um, if you, if you seriously, like, if you, if you watch the rhetorical and like ideological stand he's taking here, he, he says things like inequality, climate change, are my number one issues. But like, I would, but he's also like talking about how like you know we need to like lower capital gains rates. I would and, also oh, no bet, income tax. Either. I would, I, I would, I would also <laughs> bet that he wouldn't be. He would want to like. He would want to end the salt tax. Like, like mm -hmm. take the salt tax thing back to the pre twenty seventeen era. I think you're going to start seeing a lot more center left politicians who are probably not political in the traditional sense, who are being very aggressive rhetorically, but like sort of go to that more center left position. But yeah, Sagar, continue. My friend who loves Mark Cuban is uh, smiling right now. No, that's the, it. No, yeah, exactly. No, yeah. like, no, no, but he's no, like, but that's it's it. Mark that's Cuban. It. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's no, possible. That's a great, it wouldn't surprise it. me. <laughs> no, it's, it's interesting because I'm like, when you're talking, you're like, the future is not AOC. I'm like, yeah, but it's not Chuck Schumer either. You know, no, it's going to be I totally some agree. like, uh, right. It, it, to me, whoever the next Democrat who would think is very likely to replace Doug Ducey is, that is going to be some flavor within that. And then mm. for a long time, people on the right were like, Brian Sandoval, whatever. He was a governor of New, uh, mm -hmm. Nevada, Nevada, but he was pro-choice. So like that was always a problem. I don't know. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really interesting and you're right. It's going to be this very distinctive flavor of like left politics. Um, I, I, I would, it's maybe it's like I wouldn't call it like neoliberal exactly, but it's not as hostile to like because it's gonna have like the southwestern expansionism to it. It's really interesting. Well, you know what's interesting about, about Mark yeah. Cuban is, um, and I'm prepared to get completely virtually slotted for this, but oh yeah, what Mark Cuban offers that say um, Mayor Pete doesn't is the possibility of being a Roosevelt figure. In that Roosevelt was a rich dude screaming at rich yeah. dudes. Yes. And so, once you know, again, he was, a theme here. <laughs> he was, what I, I remember writing something like this in a piece about Mayor Pete uh, 
when lefty hate of Mayor Pete was at its max, where I said one reason why he's just such a strange figure is that he identifies up socioeconomically. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's just like he's just the mayor of South Bend, but he's also representing billionaire interest in the Democratic Party. And historically, successful Democrats have represented down. They've been aristocratic figures like FDR saying, I'm a man of the people. I'm a traitor to my class. But I'm a traitor to my class by identifying down, not by identifying, as Mayor Pete did, up, away from his class status. Mark Cuban has the ability to identify down. He can be a traitor to his own class in a way that might ring as authentic to a lot of moderate, moderate left voters who don't believe that every billionaire is a policy and moral er error, but do like the idea of someone who has, whose career and television presence is a signifier of competence, but yes. who also loves to go onto television and scream at all the other billionaires for not having yes. earned money like he did. Uh, this is not, I, I'm not paid by Mark Cuban. I actually have no like particular fondness for Mark Cuban. I literally just like don't yeah. ever spend any moment of my life thinking about Mark Cuban. I'm like just um, uh, thinking out loud here. But that would make that would make sense to me, Cuban representing this yeah. interest. And then of course, you know, Cuban becoming a kind of Bloomberg figure, uh, but with infinity times Bloomberg's um, televisual talent, uh, representing a state like Texas in a Democratic primary would make a lot of donors just slobber. Yeah, 100%. What's so funny about this, though, to tie it all together, well, A, discovering that you were paid by Mark Cuban would be the lowest yeah, level that was, scoop I'd be like, of all time, like the least consequential, least blogged about scoop of all time. But no, but to tie it all together, here's what unites all the different figures we're throwing out there, because I love your trade of the class metaphor. It's tech. Tech as an industry, in terms of the narrative it tells itself about its place in American society, is the only industry from which the – because think about it. Like, why did Howard Schultz not work within this framework? He's like a Starbucks guy. He's very traditional. He identifies with that establishment. Like, that's the point. Like, Michael Bloomberg, Wall Street, identifies with the establishment. If you're a tech person, even if you are as blue as can be as a Democrat, your narrative is still like, I'm a tech person. I'm upending the status quo. I'm going after legacy institutions. This is why, to bring it back to the – start of our conversation, our point was there are all of these figures who are operating in the Wall Street Bets conversation who are establishment, who are Harvard educated in the case of the Winklevi twins, but are very comfortable and could somewhat authentically say that they are the enemy and the opposite of that actual power establishment as represented by Wall Street. Another person we could fit into this framework too is Matthew McConaughey, who's doing his like kind of yeah. like I'm um, right wing, but he's not right wing, but he's actually just a pretty center left Democrat. If he wants to run for governor of Texas, this, he is operating in this framework too because he's signaling against Hollywood. So it's just interesting how there are these industries that are producing these sort of figures. Yeah, yeah. it's. I, I, I think I think it's plausible. Um, Governor McConaughey is not something that at this uh, moment in time I can possibly conceive of. But uh, but you know, then again, uh, you got to you know, listen President to him on Trump. Joe Rogan. He wants to Do run I? for something. Okay. You can tell. He, you, okay. he wants I, to run. I'll check yeah. that out. Um, yeah. I, th I think though that the, the, the broader thing that you're pointing to, which uh, I'm ambivalent about in terms of it being a good thing, is politics being an increasingly media-facing enterprise. Um, there are a couple news stories that come to mind right now. Uh, there was a, a, a tweet showing that the, um, the amount of tweets by sitting representatives has increased tremendously since the early 2010s. Yes. Another showing that um, something like half of congressional staffers now are engaged in some form of public relations and communications. Um, mm. Madison Cawthorn at one point said that yes. he was hiring his not to make policy. His entire staff is around Congress. His entire, yeah, he's like, I'm a congressman, but I also am like basically a media channel. I don't yes. intend to use this seat to make laws to help people. I thank the public for uh, their votes, and I'm going to make... Um, essentially a social media show for them. And if, if they like the show, they can, you know, re-up it for another season or two. Um, like yeah. that's basically his explicit promise to his voters. Uh, and, and you're also talking, you know, about two very famous men from TV and, and film, uh, potentially being the you know, leaders of the Democratic Party. Um, you know, it, it leaves something to be desired in terms of... Um, Expertise, public policy, outcomes. yeah, and public policy. Um, and I don't want—I don't want to suggest that like 
I think Mark Cuban's a really smart guy. I, yeah. I, I don't think that like, this isn't about Mark Cuban. Again, I'm being paid by Mark Cuban, so I can't, I can't <laughs> criticize him for too long here. Um, but like, like, it's not that I don't think that someone who was a co-host in Shark Tank can like make good tax policy. I just think that if, as a general principle, if we use as a kind of funneling mechanism, media fame as the most important mechanism for deciding who to lead the country, like mm. that's gonna be really fucked for a long period of time in ways that are a lot broader than just Trump period. Yeah, um, I can, and so I it, it's a little agree. concerning just that the only people we can consider uh, to lead us as a people uh, are televisual celebrities. I 100% agree with you, Derek. And this is where all of us being in D.C., like, it matters. Whereas I'm like, yeah, Trump came in and he said he was going to do X, but he didn't know how to run the or who to appoint for, like, his deputy secretary of commerce in order to make sure that that was going to happen. Or, you know, Mark Cuban, yeah, he wants a big industrial policy. Okay, I hope you know a thousand people who are ready to implement that on a bureaucratic wide level and that you know exactly how to weed through, like, who worked for whom and all that. And it's a problem. I see it with congressional staff. Most of these congressional staff are just trying to get retweeted by comfortably smug on Twitter, on the <laughs> right, and on the left. They want, like, Matt Iglesias and probably you to retweet them. They don't care about policy. They don't care about any of this stuff. It's The Iglesias ones probably care more than the comfortably smug ones. Let's be honest. But uh, Don't both of, sides this one. Yeah, well, I'm not going to both sides this one. I'll be, I'll, I will be honest, even though many of, these, many of these people consider my friends, and many of them listen to this podcast, so I'm sorry. But... If you think about what that portends for policy, it's a bad thing. Because the point I've tried to make consistently to people is that when you come in as an outsider and you just focus all on the comms, is that the machine, so to speak, just runs along uninterrupted. As in, like, you can't change policy because it's basically everything is on a stasis path. I remember probably the most insightful thing Obama ever said is he's like, you think when you're president that you can come in, you're taking this ship and that you can like turn it one way or turn it the other way. And he's like, and the truth is, is like, if you're successful, you can turn it two degrees west or two degrees east. And yeah, in the long run, that's going to end up like really, really far away. But he's like, even as president, the best I can probably do is two degrees. There's criticisms of that from progressive left and right, which I would agree with. But I think the best you can probably do at, even in a crisis like Biden, maybe like five degrees, five degrees is a lot, like like we said, and that's going to change what the dynamic is. But this is where media, I think, and thinking about how that evolves matters even more, because if this this is the industry which is going to bear out our future political leaders. Uh, and I know it's something that you've looked at a lot, too. Well, and can I say, is, yeah, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Because yeah. no, a, a, a the point that you made yeah. about... Um, Completely smug and Matt Iglesias. Yes. Um, and I, I'm not going to, yeah. obviously, I, I think Matt's brilliant. I think comfortably yes. smug is whatever. But like, um, look, what's interesting about that from a media theory standpoint mm -hmm. is that what you're saying is these electeds, handlers, and policy advisors are really just trying to impress someone else yes. in media who will amplify their status. Bingo. Which means yeah. that they're really just outsourcing their policy ideology to Matt Iglesias. Yes. In which case, the danger that I didn't even put together, but makes a lot of sense, is that if the Mark Cubans of the world get power, and or just in general, politics becomes more and more media-facing, the people we elect are outsourcing their policy to people who are outsourcing their policy to Twitter celebrities. That's so which true. means that in a weird way, it's actually government by Twitter celebrity. It's just who's your proximate Twitter celebrity, right? Yeah, and so no, the danger there is like, yeah. you, you're not actually making any determination of like, you're not electing people to make decisions. You're electing people with the hope that they surround themselves with advisors who have who follow the right people on Twitter. Like mm -hmm. that's that's a that's a little bit of a of a weird proposition for American democracy. And you know what's crazy? The, I, this reminds me. One of our favorite episodes was Jane Coaston right before the election, and she was like, "The Trump campaign is way too fucking online." It was like you know you'd see like all these dudes tweeting about like Ibrahim. Uh, by the way, like 
a lot of criticisms of Ibrahim Kendi. You can go listen to our podcast about that and critical race theory and all that. But then they put out like the 1619 Project executive order. And you're like, who is voting for this shit? Like pass some $1,200 checks. What are you talking about? Yeah. Or like they would be like, we will not. Al-. They take like some viral tweet and blow it up. Like we will not allow this to happen. Or even Trump literally measuring his campaign. Like in many of the ways, and I experienced it because a lot of these people I used to talk, was that a lot of the people in the Trump campaign would measure how they were doing relative to the criticism that they were getting online. And then they would beg us to cover it here. Or they'd beg me to cover it, you know, over on the show. Like, please, can you praise this one policy? Or like, can you write the blah? Some of it was PR, but it's exactly the dynamic that you're talking about. And, you know, I, f- I actually think it's interesting because, and look, I think Matt is, you know, pretty smart. And I'm glad we've had him on the podcast. He actually even talked about this recently where he was like, you can see that our Twitter discourse around deficits has actually measurably changed the Biden economic policy. That's a good thing. I'm I'm 100 percent for that. But you're like, "Mm," like in a conceptual level, like outsourcing it all there isn't necessarily a good thing. I think it's a great thing. You want to be. Go go ahead. And just a quick thing on this. Um. Because it speaks to, I have to do every episode. I have to like defend yeah. Joe Biden for no particularly good reason. It speaks to Joe Biden's strength as a politician right now in this moment, which is that he just either he doesn't care. know yeah. or he doesn't. I think actually doesn't care. I think yeah. he genuinely mm-hmm. does not care about this reality. And I think it's one of those issues where this isn't going to be an issue, which is naturally going to resolve itself because Joe Biden. It's an area like this is the advantage of being in politics for 40 years. He just does not care in a way that politicians that are going to come after him are going to just have to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, Joe Biden, yeah, from a media standpoint, Joe Biden was like the politician of local news. You know, he just, he kept things super <laughs> so, normal and so kind of dry and like not, and it, and, and, and won that way. I, I totally agree. I think that yeah. in a weird way, the 2020 election was the election that the internet lost. Um, mm-hmm. Joe Biden was the internet's least favorite candidate for months, for months. Yeah. Everyone I followed, and I follow a pretty wide variety of people from the politics world, were doing nothing but dumping on Joe Biden. Um, and Biden didn't care. And uh, then Trump, I totally agree with Jane on this point, went, yeah. w- got way too deep into his own Twitter world and, es- and essentially started legislating or not legislating, essentially started um, uh, uh, yeah. Just being yeah, oriented. Yeah, like Russiagate. By... Russiagate was only a thing on right wing Twitter. Nobody right. gives a shit about Russiagate or whoever right. the FBI agent is or whatever. And they're like, oh, we got to declassify him. Like, that's the MAGA priority? Like, yeah. I, declassification? I, I, think, I think it speaks to the fact that a, a challenge that, and this goes against the point I was making yeah. earlier about sort of outsourcing, electeds outsourcing their policy priorities to their favorite Twitter celebrity. Um, it's really difficult, and maybe this is true in politics and just in general life, to be the right amount of online. Um, if you go offline, I, I find this in my own job specifically, if I'm not on Twitter for two weeks and I'm like, oh, I have a good idea for like an article to write, it turns out I'm like 72 hours behind the news cycle and the article has no lift. But yeah. if I do nothing but stay on Twitter, then I don't write at all, and I get really, really sucked into like the deepest, deepest silo of some debate. It's really, really hard as a writer, I think, to be just online enough. And that like internet Goldilocks problem is something that Biden just clearly solved. He was he that that campaign was just online enough to be sensitive to people's concerns without following them into any particular area where they would be, you know. Uh, uh, shown to be out out of touch with the average American. Absolutely. So for so for our last bit here, I love that we're talking about media theory because, funnily enough, I first came across your work because I loved your 2017, 2018, like what's the state of like media crises right now? You you did a, you did a post like um both Christmases and everything. Um, but another piece you wrote recently is just about the fracturing America, the fracturing of America post 1950, which is basically summed up by America as a whole is becoming nicher and nicher. So everything is about like your niche, which is also the story of media today and how in many ways, I think the best line, my favorite line was just the point that it, it used to be enough to have MSNBC, CNN, and then Fox. And now we now have OANN. And then we also have Newsmax. So it's not even enough to like break up the former Walter Cronkite space. It needs to be broken even more up. It gets harder and harder to operate in these smaller spaces. And I'm, I don't know if you're, I'm not sure if you're on Clubhouse or anything, but last night, you know, um, Elon Musk went on Clubhouse 
Um, and Jessica Lesson at the information, who Sagar and I are a huge, huge fan of, was like talking about how because Mark Andreessen, who is in the chat as well too, blocks certain journalists from getting access, journalists couldn't actually get access to the conversation. At the same point, though, like Elon Musk doesn't really care about the fact that you're kicking out gatekeepers because he's appealing to this very niche audience of people who are the Elon Musk, like trading card sellers who are basically engaging their own version of meme stalking. So I think the broader framework that would be helpful for people is how should anyone who looks at the current state of our politics and dissatisfied think about how you work even attempt to put things back together when everything basically comes down to how can you best own and operate within a niche? both at a business model level, but also from a performance level? I think it's a great question. Um, my thesis is that you just have to operate as if everything is a cult mm -hmm. and get kind of comfortable with it. Um, culting, I think, is what successful companies do by turning customers, like Apple customers, into rabid fans of what's essentially just, you know, glass and metal and software. <laughs> Um, but it's also clearly what message boards have to do as well. Um, GameStop is a cult and QAnon is a cult. And to a certain extent, you know, there were aspects of Bernie world that were cultish too. Um, I'm a huge fan of a lot of, the, a lot of Bernie does. I'm actually, I'm, I'm ambivalent about whether or not like cults are always good or bad. I think yeah. that cults are like a mechanism. It's a, it's a cult as I'm defining it in this circumstance is a tightly bound group that is defined both positively and negatively. Negatively by a shared insistence that something about the mainstream is wrong, and positively by a similar confidence that they have the right answer. Um, and what you have, I think, in the media landscape is a kind of fragmentation that is perfect for the propagation of many, 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 many cults. Um, mm -hmm. And this really just goes back to media technology. Um, in the early 19th century, uh, the technology that was available to people in the early 1800s was steam-powered printing presses before the telegraph, which means you had thousands of local papers that had no idea what was going on anywhere else. So all you had was a million local realities. And then in the early 20th century, you had radio and television which were tightly regulated markets with international communication, such that you finally had the opportunity to have a sort of global shared reality, right? Especially in the 1950s when there's only a handful of channels in television. And now with the internet, we're sort of back to the 19th century where media technology is totally decentralized, totally decentralizing, such that we're going back to a world with many, many, many different shared realities. Um, and I think- How do you govern that? Mostly, well, yeah, that's that's the real question. Yeah, the you you don't to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. it, it is almost until something else comes along that is mm -hmm. uh, naturally centralizing. Um, reality is ungovernable, um, especially with the First Amendment. It just shouldn't be illegal for a bunch of people to be misled about stuff. It's just an inevitable part of the sort of riotous market of ideas. That that's, what sh that's just what's gonna happen. You're gonna have lots of people who have their own little cultish fantasies. And the, the way that you, so it's not governable in the biggest sense, but the way you try to govern is what I suggested Joe Biden do in my piece two weeks ago. You, you go big, you go fast, and you go simple. Um, yeah. Big, fast, and simple means you have a handful of priorities that you communicate extremely clearly, you focus on them, and you make sure that those achievements are felt in people's lives. Um, that they're so obvious that they cut through the cultifying sort of film of media. Yeah. That it doesn't matter what Fox News or OAN tells you about your bank account. If it increases exactly. by 1400 and Biden goes on television and is like, hey, uh, that was me. I did, the, I did that. I did the yeah. 1400. There it is. That's 1400. If there is a universal child allowance that gives you $300 a month for your two kids and you get that into your checking account every single month, it doesn't matter what anyone on Fox News tells you. you the money is yours. And Joe Biden, again, can go on TV and be like, hey, 
Hey everyone, you see all that money that's in your bank account? Yep, that's me too. You do things that people feel. The, I, the, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know any other possible way you can, you can combat this. Because I don't think you can combat it at like the epistemic level, at the media level. The, the Pandora's box is open and the monster's fucking everywhere. You, yeah. you have to combat it at the level of big, fast, and simple policy. So for our last two questions, Ben, you, you said so much there, it's like really great. Um, we'll have to do another episode at some point. But here's my question, though. You made the point that you can't, you basically argued you can't just govern these things. You can't make these choices. But here's the problem, especially if you're at a tech company, you actually can. Reddit like killed the QAnon forum years ago. <laughs> um, Twitter killed QAnon and it's gone, right? Like I, I have family members who are into Q stuff, like they've moved on. So I'm not saying on a philosophical level, that means they'd made the right decision in some degrees, which is because there, 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 there are cults that I would find like deeply off-putting and even dangerous that I wouldn't support like censoring or banning, but you actually can govern them, right? So like, how do we, how, you, you kind of get what I'm saying. What I'm saying is like, we could say that you can't, but like, it seems to me there's a lot of evidence right. I guess, that you can. Yeah, I, what, what I, I want to be clear in saying that I initially took your question, this might not have been its intent, as saying, what does an executive or legislative branch do about the fact that the internet allows a bunch ah. of different people to create a bunch of different Facebook and Gab and Parler and Twitter groups that often ex participate in the construction of a reality that is fictional. And my answer is, I don't know what, I have no idea. Yeah. I have no idea. It, it, having, I, I'm not saying nothing should be done. I'm saying the project of deciding what kinds of misunderstandings or fictions about the world are all right and which ones are illegal it's a fucking mess and i yeah. have no idea how you, what 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 that looks like i'm not saying no law should be made i'm saying i literally just don't don't know how 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 you handle it well, what i love about that is so we actually do largely agree cuz you cuz like you were answering this in the context of the state what's interesting is that from my perspective and then sagar will go to you for your last one which is that tech companies are being asked to govern in a way and make those decisions. That's where a lot of the controversy comes from. And then the tech companies in themselves, for a variety of reasons that I actually largely support, are outside of the realm of like state or government action. So like that's where you see a lot of those governing decisions lead to controversy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, cle yeah, well clearly, clearly Facebook and Twitter have been put in the position of acting like quasi-political institutions because there's no political law to guide the decision making. Mm -hmm. I, I, I get that point. Um, but I don't know, maybe, maybe, maybe you should go in and offer your two cents because I just don't know, I don't have like the white paper on hand to be like, uh, this is how to fix the situation going forward. Like, oh, I, agree, I agree of course, that like, QAnon is horrible and it's, it's probably a better world where, where QAnon specifically as like cannot share information about like, you know, elite Jews like drinking the blood of children. Like it's a better world where as few as people as mm -hmm. possible are talking about Jews drinking blood. Um, but I don't know how you write legislation that is broadly applicable, that bans that kind of talk, unless you essentially try, unless you ban something that isn't talk, right? Yes. You ban yeah. like the, the, some connection between language, communication, and incitement. Um, but I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know exactly how to frame that. 100%. You know, it's just funny because while you're talking, I, I almost, I'm kind of, I'm not saying it's a fatalist position, but it's more just like, ah, this is how it's going to be. And you made a really interesting point there about the steamboat, like pre-steamboat, and when we had a thousand different papers. If you think about what, like, life for the average American in the 1840s was, like, the federal government, like, wasn't really a thing. Mm -hmm. Like, in terms of, like, how you thought about it, you're like, yeah, like, you know, we're in the United States, like, we we vote in a presidential election, and we do, actually, they didn't even have income tax then, so, like, it's like mm -hmm. we pay our booze tax to mm -hmm. Andrew Jackson, and that's about it. But, like, it mostly was inconsequential. Um, and a lot of those decisions were made like within the communities themselves, um, not really from somebody at the top down. It's very possible that we, I'm not saying, you know, we're going to have like cults that govern themselves the way that some towns did and stuff, but it might be analogous to that. And it's downstream of the media environment that we're living in. And I think that that's just really fascinating to think, what does that look like in a 21st century environment? Yeah. Um, I encourage people to read uh, What Hath God Wrought? which is a history of America between the, uh, just after 
the maybe 1815 between to 1848. 1815 to 1848. Oh, this is the I, Oxford I, history. I, the I, never I have not read yeah. any of them, but I know yeah. which ones I need to talk about. That's so I read funny. Freedom from Fear. I didn't read the, uh, the other ones. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, what, what if God wrought? It was recommended to me by Jordan Weissman at Slate, who's fantastic. And uh, I am obsessed with the 19th century, and in particular with sort of the fount of inventiveness in the 19th century, like the fact that literally everything was invented in like yeah. a 30-year span between 1880 and 1910, um, except for the telegraph and, and the train. And the telegraph and the train just like completely smashed the ancient world. Like mm-hmm. the world that was shrunk by the telegraph and the train was just so different than the one that came before it. And it's interesting to think that we might in, ironically just be going back to that like pre-telegraph train world yeah. where local realities were permitted to flourish uh, because there was no ability for people to communicate across distances. Now it's because people don't want to communicate across distances. They recognize they'd much prefer to have their uh, you know confirmation bias lapped up um, by their uh, local media, whatever it is. There you go. All right, Derek, really appreciate this conversation, man. Um, where can people check uh, check all your work out? Derek Thompson, I think, is Derek Thompson on Twitter? D- uh, DK Thomp on Twitter, DK Thomp and at The Atlantic. And uh, yeah, that'd be good. Cool, man. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks.